I'm very delighted um, to welcome you today uh, to the Center for Global Finance uh, seminar series uh, for today, uh, the 21st of uh, October. Uh, I'm so glad that you could make uh, you could make it and join us uh, for this uh, interesting interesting discussion. But before I go into the um, uh, introducing the speaker, uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, mention a couple of um, housekeeping um, um, uh, points. Uh, one is that uh, we do have a chat room uh, where you can post your comments, suggestions. Uh, please use the chat room. Uh, number two, uh, that we have um, uh, uh, a raise hand symbol, which allows you to raise your hand so that um, uh, I'm chairing, I can be able to pick um, to ask you to speak. Uh, and for all time, uh, apart from the presenter, uh, please mute uh, your microphone uh, uh, so that uh, we can have um, a, a clear a, uh, a discussion without a lot of background noise. Uh, and uh, when you are asked to speak, then you can unmute uh, your microphone and then uh, make uh, your contribution, uh, you make your input. Uh, um, I think uh, uh, with that, uh, I have great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Bojo uh, from Linköping University in Sweden. Uh, Bo and I go a long way back, uh, many, many years ago, uh, uh, in the um, um, work in finance and economics in the transformation of Eastern Europe uh, uh, in the late uh, 1990s up to 2000 and so forth, where we spent a lot of time working on the uh, economies of Eastern Europe, Estonia, Poland, Lithuania, a, uh, with the, a lot of um, a, uh, partners uh, uh, from the UK, uh, from uh, Europe. Uh, um, and I think um, uh, um, uh, also from uh, many partners uh, uh, in the US uh, as part of um, a research that informed the uh, transformation uh, or um, uh, the moving into market economies um, uh, of the Eastern Europe uh, uh, countries. Uh, but um, um, at the moment, uh, uh, Bojo and I are part of uh, Group C uh, of the African Economic Research Consortium. Uh, so uh, we have the opportunity of uh, meeting uh, twice every year to make some serious input uh, in the research projects uh, going on. Uh, um, in many uh, universities in Africa, uh, especially in the area of finance. And uh, Abojo is a leading uh, resource person there. Uh, actually, way back uh, into uh, training, we are both uh, active uh, in the training of our PhD students in Africa. And the moment uh, we are actively involved uh, in uh, um, uh, uh, providing uh, resource input into a number of uh, uh, many uh, research projects uh, that are taken uh, by um, colleagues from African universities. Um, he is a competent uh, econometrician and uh, uh, economist, but working mainly uh, in, in the area of finance. Finance is his main specialism. And I'm so delighted that uh, he could uh, come to share uh, his uh, work with us. And today speaking about uh, energy uh, uh, efficiency, uh, which has a lot of um, uh, implications for uh, CO2, uh, sustainable finance, uh, which is now categorized as number two risk uh, globally. Uh, so, uh, Bojo, we are delighted to have you. Uh, 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 please speak as long as you want. And uh, uh, what we shall do is that um, at the end, we shall go through the comments on the chat room. So while Bojo is speaking and you have a comment to make, please type it in the ch chat room. But if you want to speak, then also you can raise up your hand. So both the chat room and the uh, raise your hand uh, um, facility are available to uh, for, uh, to enable us to uh, interact. Bojo, we are so glad to have you here. Uh, please go ahead and share your research with us. Yeah, yeah thank you for inviting me. Uh, I will talk about 
bit of housing financing stuff today. Otherwise, I would have talked about something related to Africa and finance and commodities. But this is a project that we have been doing for two years and we have some money for it and we have money for conferences, etc. But the COVID put an end to our conference presentation. So it's nice when I report the results to say that we had at least some international exposure. So my name is Bo Schö, I'm the presenter. Uh, David Stenewald is my PhD student that I finance through this project. Pontus Serin is an extremely valuable resource because he is an engineer who knows finance as well. Uh, and he has very well contacts, is a well-known name in, in the area of environmental, climate change, uh, etc., etc. And then Gazi Salahuddin is, uh, I call him my former PhD student. He is now a professor also. He's from Bangladesh and is a very good finance researcher and also good at econometrics. The topic today is, does energy efficiency matter for prices of tenant-owned apartments? Or you can say, are energy efficiency ratings capitalized in house prices? Hmm. Uh, this is something that we have been working on and is still working on. So. Uh, my extremely good PhD student who never gives up. He, he wants to rerun the regressions and test some more things uh, before the final paper. And, and we hope to be able to get another two year of financing for this project. So we guess the main objective here is do homeowners capitalize information on energy efficiency related information in the prices of their prospective home. So uh, as you know, energy is part of the cost of owning a house and an apartment. The question is how much does it actually play a role when you buy an apartment? So in this specific paper then, we look at how much does the uh, energy efficiency affect prices on tenant-owned apartments? And this is something that hasn't really been studied so much before. So there are very few studies on this topic, actually. And it's an area where there's a huge room for, say, improvements here. So I will come to that in the end. So what's the background here and why should you care? And the answer is, of course, the climate change and the CO2 business. That really means a lot for transformation of our energy systems. So there are lots of research money coming in this area, a lot actually. But when we talk about things like finance, forecasting, the limitation of resources, incentives for doing this and that, all that economists are good at, is it really there in the research calls? Uh, not really as much as it should be. Say I am uh, an economist, of course, but it's not a things directed to engineers here, which is obvious. But then also it becomes very general to all sorts of social sciences. So when you look for this money, you have to be quite innovative and you have to be prepared to actually convince the people who have those research money that you can actually do a good contribution here. Uh, because what I can see in Sweden is that many of those who now hand out research money here has a very skewed view of economics, to put it in a mild way. In fact, they often refer to very strange people who talk about economics in ways that we ordinary economics do not recognize at all. And the other thing, how much of this you know, transformation of our energy systems are uh, really relevant outside the EU and North America? I don't really know so much about that, but uh, it, it seems that developing countries are a bit left behind here, that a lot of the research money is very much, you know, various engineering projects and transformation of 
energy systems and the economies in the developed world. So one part of, of the problem is the housing sector. And what I discovered when I, I looked in this area was that in Sweden, there are very few economists and econometricians that, that can look at the pricing of houses or the bubbles. Uh, the Stockholm area prices are going up and up is the bubble. Who can test it? I didn't find that many people who actually could, they were interested in it. So th that's why I saw that, well, here's a chance to finance at least one PhD student and try to build up something in this area in our department. Uh, then also the need for buildings and housing, how do you forecast that? And then you, you also have the development of cities, you know, a big area. We talk about transport, you know, waste and energy, all that stuff that needs to be planned and organized somehow. So there are research areas here for economists that I think uh, economists should look more into actually. So uh, that, that's a, my, my general background here for why this research is interesting for a wider audience actually. So if you look at the European Union then, we know that 40% of the any use is related to the building sector. And you can say around 36% then is CO2 emissions, but then less than 10% of GDP and jobs. Uh, and uh, if you look across countries, then the numbers are, are quite similar actually across EU and, and OECD countries. Then of course, when we talk about Sweden, it's different. In the sense that we have, we, we're Nordic country, climate is different, of course, and also the energy sources are different. But anyhow, the background is that the EU then come with a directive that said that all buildings should have an energy performance uh, certificate. So that in particular, when there is a, a sale of, of a property here, the buyer should look at this energy performance certificate, get an idea about how high are the energy costs for this building. And the EU then has uh, really aimed at making this mandatory and it's being implied in quite a number of countries. Uh, the thing is just how, how many of the houses are actually covered by this uh, certificate and that is increasing over time we can say. So the idea is that you, you should actually see what is the current standard and what is a better energy efficient house compared to the less energy efficient houses. So there is a huge database being built up in, in many countries that uh, includes uh, prices and various characteristics of the property sold and then the energy efficiency. So data is coming but not always that easy to get their, your hands on perhaps. So the if you go back here to 2010 then we can see that yeah quite a number of EU countries implemented the energy certificates quite early on and the rest are also coming now. Uh, so the idea is really to, to press this on buyers of property and uh, First of all, we talk about single family houses, of course. You should be aware of this and actually see quite clearly what are the energy costs of this building. And uh, you also try to really make it mandatory and uh, stated that this is very important. So you should also have when you advertise the sale of a building and a house, you should actually inform everyone directly about this energy performance certificate and how this building is more or less energy efficient. And that might be a good thing in the end, of course. So if you look at the energy usage in Sweden then for houses, well, then there are of course climate differences between Sweden and other countries, but also in Sweden because it's a, it's a long stretch country. The south and north has quite different climate. We also have lots of hydrogen and nuclear energy 
compared to other countries. Uh, if you live in a town, then you are typically connected to the municipality water-based heating system that comes from industries or burning waste, typically. On the countryside, you might use electricity on its way out. No one is using oil anymore. You can use wood and terminal heating, which is very popular. And for a typical house, you can see that heating will be 57%, appliances 23 and warm water 19%. So again, if we look at the Netherlands and Sweden and, and compare that, we can see that typically Sweden has much more hydropower and nuclear power than Netherlands and Netherlands use more gas, of course. So these indicate differences, but uh, these differences doesn't come out that clearly when we estimate numbers here. So it's more like different countries start from yeah, different angles here and have different energy systems, but they don't seem to affect so much the final estimates we come to in the end. If you look at now the, the certificates, in Sweden the new implementation really starts from 2014, and then you have a range of A to G, where A and B is very good, and C then corresponds to the energy efficiency that the building would have if it was built today with today's standards and requirements for energy efficiency. So as you see, there are no room here for going beyond what the regulations are actually requiring you to do. So the idea is that then when, you, when you buy a, a house here, you should see this certificate and also, you should get the suggestions for improving energy efficiency as well, because these certificates are then done by, say, approved agencies and people who are certified to do this, and they will also check for yeah, improvements. So there are also data on the suggestions in the databases, so we can see if people have taken some actions here and actually done something when they sell the house again, for instance. As an instrument then, well, it improves the transparency for the buyer about the cost of energy here. And that's a big part of owning a house, of course. Either you need heating or you need cooling, depending on where you live, and sometimes you need both. And uh, everything else equal here, a buyer might they want to pay more for an energy efficient house and bid down prices on the not so energy efficient. And of course, if you see the certificate in the process of buying, that really stimulates you to think about this. And then if you also have these cost reduction improvements, then it becomes even more transparent. And then for the seller, of course, this is an incentive to actually invest in energy savings measures because it might increase the value of the house and you might get, a, of course, a higher price when you sell it. Of course, the bad side here could be if you improve your house and then have to pay higher property taxes, that is not so good. So you have to really think about the consequences here uh, and make sure that taxation of houses and the value of your house then is perhaps adjusted then for your energy improvements so that you're not punished in the end for trying to improve the energy efficiency, of course. So the question is then, how strong is the effect from these certificates? Do they actually affect the pricing in the end? Do they stimulate investments? So one thing you can think about are of course green bonds. Green bonds are issued then for projects that have some clear green outcome and improves the environment somehow. And, and also that there's uh, some regulations that might force investment funds to buy green bond, bonds, so they really have to uh, buy them. And uh, of course some buy them automatically because they think they're good. This is also an interesting area to look at 
uh, because again, it, it might be that some of these green bones are, are not so green. I mean, the idea is, of course, that the green bones should be connected to some actually green investment and not just be a, a big town borrowing money. And then this money is, is not really earmarked for anything green. Uh, that not, might not be a green bond in my view necessarily. Anyhow, there, there are things to look into here. And also have a critical eye then, of course, and as a researcher, uh, look at this from a critical perspective. Is it really good? And uh, is the, really the return from these bonds actually really covering the cost of owning them in the end? Anyhow, you can use, of course, green bonds for any savings investments. And you can offer that to people who own houses or perhaps own apartments as well. And that is still not well developed. It's, it's just starting up a bit. So in, in Sweden then, we have at least one bank specializing in, in housing loans that offers you uh, actually green loans. So if you buy a house with a good energy performance certificate, you, you get a reduction in, in the interest rate you pay, minus 10 basis point there. If you buy a house with a rating of A or B, then you get minus five basis points if you buy a house that's it's rated just C. Uh, I don't know if that also applies to apartments, but we can easily see that we can extend this thinking. So when I first saw it, I was afraid that myself, who doesn't live in a very energy efficient house or building, would have to pay uh, lower interest rates for other people. But uh, when I checked into the bank what we're doing, they were actually issuing green bonds to finance these discounts. They're not perhaps very big, but at least it's a start. And we can easily think about measures to improve these things and expand it, of course. If you look at the previous research in this area, uh, there's been a number of studies here because we have pricing data and we have these certificates. So, uh, and there's often plenty of data. Then people typically find that when you look at single family houses that you can get a premium up to 5% then for the more energy efficient houses. So it seems to have an effect. Some studies do not find any effect at all, and no one really finds any significant negative effects. But, the, but in general, the rule of thumb say about 5% here. In particular, if you really compare the most efficient with the really low efficient houses. Uh, so this is also done outside the EU. You have similar things in, in North America, even though it's more voluntary. So uh, you, you find research also for North America and Australia and places like that. However, when you look at industrial and commercial property, there are not so much results to get. So that area is still a bit underexplored. And also when it comes to apartments, they're not very much research. People have looked into rented apartments and then they really don't find any effect at all. Uh, so there is also say, a, a bit of a black area. You could probably do more here when you look at that. But the thing is that if you own a rental apartments, you typically own them for a long time and you probably do what you can to be energy efficient and, and save costs. And the question is more than, do you need to subsidize specific types of investments more? But then we come to the topic of our paper here, the tenant-owned apartments. When people buy their own apartments, how are they affected by energy costs and energy certificates? Uh, and that is something that uh, the one I looked into before, really. And the reason we look into it is, first of all, 
that we were going to expand an historical study on family houses, but uh, there was other researchers beating us on that thing. So we do have such a study also, but it's not very novel that we find the same result as others. So we looked at these tenant owned apartments instead. So when we come to single family houses, then uh, we should mention the Netherlands and Brunner and Koch from Maastricht. Uh, they are very good in this area and uh, were also the first to start to look into this. But then you have studies for Wales, Spain, England, Denmark, etc. And uh, early on, I, I just put together some results, uh, but this needs to be updated, which uh, again goes through the various research you have here. And uh, most of them have quite similar methods. And again, people typically find some effect here. But uh, there are problems with this type of research that we have to discuss. Mm -hmm. uh, the method is typically the, the abuser called hedonic regression models. And that is the fact that housing is a good with many characteristics. So the basic thing when you want to sell property is location, location, location. Those are the three most important things. But beyond that, you have to look at renovation needs in the house, the age, and what does the kitchen look like, the bathroom, the garage, etc. What's the environment around the house and stuff like that. <laughs> so when people buy houses, that they have a huge vector of characteristics that they look at and they put things together. And of course, some old houses might be very nice and. Uh, and be very interesting to live in because they actually are very beautiful, but then they might have a, of course, a bad energy use. And, and how do people then value these things when they compare them? So the hedonic regression models, they, they try to capture all the relevant characteristics of a house or an apartment, which is, of course, difficult to do. So our model basically looks like this, based on the variables we know and have our hands on. So you have the log of the price, in our case, the apartment. And then we can look at the, uh, <coughs> the dummy variable for the uh, energy efficiency at the top level, and then you can also have a dummy then for the lowest level. Then we know the age of the house, we know the area of the apartment, we know the fee or, or the rent of the apartment, but it's not really an, a, a rent, you, you pay a monthly fee then. And then you have the number of rooms, you know when it's been renovated, and then we can also add a time dummy. We have a dummy for the different towns, and then we can also add the zip code. And of course, the zip code will give you the area and if it's rich or poor area and stuff like that. So that is our say, baseline model that we then play around with a lot. And uh, for apartments then, 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 then we have the argument that they are more homogeneous than single family houses and therefore reduces the problem uh, with all these uh, different characteristics. So that is probably true to some extent, but still apartments can be quite different, of course, depending on how it's been renovated and stuff like that. But, uh, but anyhow, that, that's a problem and we have to find ways of dealing with it. So we run basically an ordinary least squares model of this price model that we have. But then there are hidden characteristics between houses with good energy performance and bad energy performance. And the question then is how bad is that? How much will it affect the outcome? So to dig deeper into these things, we do quantile regressions to see then if there is some differences between the uh, price bracket of houses here. 
So you might say that the rich people who buy expensive houses, they don't really care about the energy costs because they can afford to pay it. That could be a uh, typical hypothesis. And then of course, poor people might be very careful and also look at the energy costs more, costs more carefully. Uh, and then to do more specific testing of the sample selection bias, that is that, yeah, good energy performance also come with some very nice hidden characteristics. We can do then propensity score matching and a so-called coarse and exact matching. So we try to have two different groups of houses and we try to compare them and make them very similar and see then if the uh, effect from this NE performance certificate comes out clearer or less or less clearly. So these tenant owned apartments are quite popular in Sweden. Uh, residents don't really pay heating individually. The cost is included in the monthly fee. So on an individual basis then your incentives for yeah, improving the energy efficiency is not that strong, but you are of course interested in it because as you are part owner of the whole building and the common ownership here is of course of interest then. But on an individual basis, why should you isolate your windows and, and why should you care about the hot water and stuff like that if you don't really pay for it directly? So there's room for innovation here and economies are good at incentives and nudging. So as a research area, we, we could do more here. And of course, green bonds is one instrument, both to the, to the so-called uh, tenant owned apartment owners then, they could get green loans no, and no. the individuals could also get green loans, of course for doing improvements. So, so uh, yeah, yeah, if I look if at I look myself, at myself my, my, my window with my apartments is quite, is quite rough. rough. They've been, they have so, been many so many years, years. Uh, and that, that is that because, was because uh, I hold them tight, tight to my money, to my money and, and spend them in so uh, But uh, uh, next week, week I will pull up some guys who can make payments. We need to ask some people to mute. OK. Yeah. Is that okay now? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So next week I will call up the maintenance guy and ask them to come and, and help me with my draft windows. That will cost me some money, but I, I, I think it's worth it now. So how do we make people actually do more energy savings investments? That's uh, incentive questions basically here. So here's the background again, 40, almost 50% of households live in multi-dwelling units, apartment buildings. And then if you look at the apartments, well, 58% live in rental apartments and 40% something in tenant owned homes or housing cooperatives. And these uh, tenant owned homes, it's a tenant association who owns the building and its members have the right to live there, use the apartment, and are responsible for all the indoor maintenance, except plumbing and heating. So uh, you, you buy the right to become a member of this association. So it's not like you own shares. And these associations, they, they can be from two apartments to say 300 or more apartments. So I live in this tenant owned house and we have 124 apartments and I am the chairman in the association. So I know a little bit how they work. And the thing is, of course, how do we make our members like me then uh, tighten up their windows? Because in the end that would save our cost a lot. And some of our energy efficient investments is not really solar panels because that would take 23 years to get our money back if we instead change the ventilation system to a more modern system. We saw that we could 
for almost the same amount of money, get our money back in in two, three years time, actually. But anyhow, it's a struggle there. Uh, so we have both actually price data on uh, apartments that have been sold. And then we have information about them, the apartments also. And uh, <clears throat> we have an example six Swedish cities. First the big ones and then some middle sized one and also a spread across then the different say climate zones mainly. And then we apply the hedonic price models and other than tortures of the baseline models we can say. So in all we have a sample of 21,700 apartments. Our basic idea here was to go for the Swedish government agency for housing and ask for their data because they buy property data from another government agency and that is quite expensive to buy. But it turned out that they actually deleted the data after I think one and a half year. So they bought the data for quite a lot of money and used it for their own purposes and then simply deleted it and bought new ones. So uh, it took us quite some time to yeah, solve these problems with that agency. And uh, it's also enforced by prior beliefs here that there are too little economists involved in this business. And also this government agency really lacks economists now uh, and econometricians who can actually analyze these things. So we had to rethink our project uh, quite heavily from the beginning, but uh, we're still working on that to get back to uh, property data and all sales of property in Sweden for the last say 10, 12 years and then see what changes when property are sold more than once in this sample. But that then, yeah, that takes you into big data problems and that stuff. So here's our baseline results, you can say. So we have as our control variables, the size of the apartment, the age, we have the rental fee, we have the number of rooms, we have information about the renovations, and we have the uh, time of fixed effect and the town fixed effect, and we have a postal code fixed effect. And then we do find a difference in pricing between the high and the low energy apartments. But uh, you have to be quite sure that you look at the extremes to get the result here. So, Our capitalization range is, is between two and three and a half percent. So it comes out about half or almost half of what people find for the single family houses. So we have a result here that, that points to that, yeah, people, even though they do not really pay the heating costs directly in their monthly rental fee, they seem to care about it a little bit. But uh, it also has a tendency for higher price sensitivity here when you look at the uh, lower end of the price scale. But it's it, but very weak actually when you compare them. However, when we start torturing the data a little bit and start to ask critical questions uh, and test them for the sample bias that might come then from missing the characteristics of those apartments that have you know, higher energy standards. Then uh, we find that the difference goes down perhaps to 1% and becomes insignificant. So a critical view here seems to be that the effect isn't really big. 
perhaps non-existent and meaning that yeah there are room for improvements here uh, so if the government and the various agencies really want to affect these things they they should sit down and think about solutions here and improvements so we can say we had a quite well performed implementation and adoption of these energy performance certificates in sweden uh, we have taken it very seriously you can say uh, the energy performance is associated with price premium for you look at family single houses then we can say that there is a clear effect then on the swedish market and uh, very much so for houses constructed before 1960. Uh, and then you can look at various characteristics and see yeah it's still there when we look at the single family houses when we look at the apartments then we don't see that effect as strong and we can be critical about having any significant effect really so the whole thing here is that you can do a number of improvements here to see if you can increase the awareness of the say about the energy costs and uh, if you want to do something here for uh, yeah energy efficiency and reducing co2 the basic problem is that houses are built to stand there for a long time so we can of course have very good requirements for new buildings but that's not going to change very much because most of the energy usage is, is in houses that has already been built and we cannot just build new houses to solve the problem so we really have to look at how can we improve the use of energy in the existing buildings and so that is the challenge and then these energy performance certificates is a start then and especially if you can also include some ideas about you know hands-on improvements in building and apartments when you do the classification here and the other thing is then how do you stimulate people to do more energy efficient investments and then yeah i think that for each sale here and especially when we talk about tenant owned apartments that uh, really make sure that the uh, any declaration is there and, and visible not only in the advertisement of the sale but also when you actually look at the apartment and when you ask questions about the property because that is still i think a missing link from looking at uh, what happens when you go around to look for say apartment and houses because then those documents are not really that visible anymore then then it's more discussion about you know look at this nice kitchen or stuff like that uh, so and then you have more use of, of the green bonds then if you look at this from a financing perspective uh, yeah. create incentives then through so much cheaper loans then for doing investments that will save energy uh, we can then discuss of course if we should have more direct regulations and stuff like that and that can also be good if it is so that you have a very clear benefit and the technology is there and widely spread but uh, typically for the green bonds type of thing and you can borrow it is much more flexible because then people can try perhaps different techniques and different types of methods for reducing energy efficiency it's so much easier to switch than if you try to actually formulate very direct regulations and prescribe exactly what people should do in different situations anyhow my main message here is that yeah there is a 
room here for economists to actually look into this transformation of our energy systems and also very much in developing countries because that is lagging behind a lot actually and in developing countries you know the the cost factor is very important here simply ordinary people have a problem with electricity not to mention then electricity from solar panels and so-called alternative energy uses so it is important that this research actually starts and that the economists come in and really point out that when you increase energy prices you can also make people become much poorer and they might not like that in the end so they will vote for politicians that don't think this is a big problem uh, and then again as i told you then i'm not going to present the econometric ideas here and go into the details of the econometric techniques because that's a different seminar, I think. So I just want you to uh, get some ideas and insight into this part of research and the fact that there is quite a lot of research money in this area about you know, transforming energy systems and housing is part of that. And it's of course quite important for ordinary people because housing is a huge cost for us uh, and uh, heating and hot water is also a huge cost and economists do have the tools for investigating these things more carefully. So that ends my presentation today here. Oh thank you uh, so much uh, uh, Bojo uh, for are presenting this uh, interesting paper and uh, uh, making the presentation so clear um, and so detailed and so uh, uh, motivating. Um, 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 it has um, important implications uh, uh, not only for uh, the uh, study focus on Sweden, but I think it has a great potential for, um, uh, for many countries. And as you yourself indicated, a, uh, for uh, research in Africa. I remember very well that about five years ago, uh, Paul Corey at Oxford and a group of people started some work uh, on a, uh, African cities uh, where they are looking at the, uh, the phenomenal growth of um, you know, African cities. And I think um, an extension of that and what you have mentioned here uh, is to look into a property development um, and especially the uh, tendency now uh, to populate um, uh, the African cities with apartment buildings um, uh, along, along in the cities rather than um, you know traditional houses. So I guess energy efficient investments uh, for apartment buildings in African cities um, would be absolutely attractive um, um, as um, an interesting uh, uh, research uh, idea. Uh, so um, let me now um, uh, open the discussion uh, to uh, all participants. Uh, so first I will look at what is available in the chat and then I'll take on some um, you know, comments by show of hands. So let me move to uh, in the chat room. Uh, there was, um, let me go back to the observations made. Um, first, there was a summary, um, then appreciation uh, by Aisha Demir on a very interesting topic, um, indeed. Um, uh, and then another comment on applications to uh, Africa, a, a comment on the hedon hedonic pricing model, because it generates empirics which can easily be translated into policy and practice. And actually, um, um, current um, uh, estimation programs um, uh, cover standard uh, hedonic pricing uh, featured in uh, Chris Brooks' book, uh, featured also uh, in Stata and uh, eViews. So um, is it to implement? Uh, and um, Aisha asks a question uh, 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 that does that mean that the incentives of the individuals differ among those that live in the tenant owned and rental apartments in terms of efficient energy use. Uh, what is the approach adopted by tenant associations 
uh, to what extent the tenants are financially literate in terms of uh, using uh, green bonds. Those, I think, are interesting uh, 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 comments. So maybe um, uh, uh, we can take one by one a uh, uh, Bojo and try to respond to uh, the comments by Aisha. If I could read through again, uh, does that mean that the incentives of the individuals differ among those that live in the tenant owned and rent apartments in terms of efficient energy use? And what is the approach adopted by tenant association and to what extent the tenants are financially literate in terms of using uh, green bonds? Thank yeah. you. So, so when you look at apartments then, and if you rent the apartment, uh, there are proposals uh, and some have implemented to actually make people who rent pay explicitly for cold and hot water uh, and the energy use with heating etc. Uh, but the thing is that the cost of implementing that technology is so high that it doesn't really pay off, at least not so far. I, I lived in such an apartment once and uh, yeah it really stimulated me to, to not shave under running, run, running hot water and stuff like that because I find it was quite expensive. I could read off the cost directly of having my tap water just running. So uh, it did stimulate me but then again the savings then compared to the investment wasn't that big to motivate uh, general implementation of this. But again as technology improves then that will probably be an idea. And the other thing is then, yeah, the, there are potential energy efficient investments lying around and the question is just to stimulate people to do them. Of course, for the people who are directly responsible or for the organization, say, you own apartment buildings or you have a tenant association and part of that one. Then you have more traditional ways of doing it as costs go up and stuff like that. But the, the thing is that you can probably do more to make these certificates become even more transparent. And then if the more qualified the person is who do these certificates and, and approve them in terms of also suggesting improvements. That, that's another thing. Uh, but the problem is that if you then compare these tenant owned apartments, it can probably look quite different between different countries. So, I mean, in some countries, you, you're more like uh, perhaps a, a shareholder and you have much more direct interest in, uh, say, the uh, common budget than you have in, in the Swedish system because. In the Swedish system, yeah, you, you take care of all your, say, indoor maintenance as you want. Uh, and that means that you, yeah, it costs you less in the long run often. But then again, what are your incentives then for actually not using hot water and um, for closing windows and stuff like that? It's not so big because again, it becomes a tragedy of the commons in the end. Especially then if you have you're in a very big housing community, of course, and a big society here. But uh, I do think that smart people come up with some smart ideas how to improve things more than I can. Because I, I would really like to redo this study in, in the future. If we now come up with better ideas and more stimulations for energy efficient investments to so see then how can these people who buy apartments think more carefully about any usage and how can we then create incentives for them to become more efficient in terms of energy. Because again, I mean, the thing is that the houses we already have, they will still stand there for quite some time. Uh, thank then, you. Yeah, and also if those about in commercial properties, uh, yeah. that is also another area where we can do more things, you know. Yeah, thanks, so because I was going to hint on, a, um, say, 
uh, if one was looking at this from the say the perspective of the UK or the, some other economies, um, you have um, um, say uh, council houses, which uh, council apartments, which are uh, constructed by a um, um, uh, the government and uh, uh, to provide a, a low cost housing for certain groups. And then you have uh, private sector apartments, which are you know profit making. And I think the incentives provided um, uh, might uh, be slightly different uh, to cater for uh, the differences in those sectors. Yeah. Uh, I think, thank you very much, Boju, for your response and for the great presentation. It was quite insightful. Uh, I think uh, from uh, uh, what I observed from your response is that I think uh, the literacy on not only in terms of using energy, uh, green bonds, finance, uh, matters, but also energy use, the literacy on energy use that should be provided to the tenants also matters. Because people, most people are not aware to what extent their carbon footprint comes when they use energy. So when their awareness on this increase, so this would also affect their level of using green energy using energy uh, efficiency so uh, maybe this might be taken into account for the further research to what extent if they have given a literacy on the energy use efficient energy use to what extent this would increase their habits in terms of uh, using efficient energy and mm. also, also using sustainable finance green bonds or loans provided by banks these uh, premiums, to what extent this will stimulate their uh, incentives towards efficient energy use? Oh, yes, indeed, that's a very good comments. Um, again, uh, the, the Swedish system then is uh, in many ways well developed in towns then, because then you are typically hooked up to a, a central heating water-based system that is often quite efficient then, and much more efficient than the individual warming of houses. And, uh, and that, that is not cheap. So again, people are aware of the fact that you have to pay a lot then if you're a single house, and that uh, when you have your own house, you should really look for energy savings. But then when it comes to apartments, I, I think it's, yeah, you pay the rent or you pay the fee, and the question is how strong are then the incentives then to actually work with energy efficiency in more detail when you can just you know, push the cost towards the end user, namely the people paying the rents and the fees here. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Aisha. Thank you, uh, thank you, Bojo. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, Bojo for those observations. Uh, we have... Um, a uh, hand up. Uh, this is the uh, Amidu Mohammed, uh, University of Ghana, Alegon. Uh, Amidu, good to see you uh, uh, in the seminar. Uh, please um, unmute and ask your question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my my question goes as follows. Yeah. In 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 Africa. In Africa, how do we want or how do one manage energy or use energy efficiently where government policy normally is drive to buying both using the energy cost? Yeah, you always have a problem with say, too much politics and you, you say that you have to subsidize things like food and energy because poor people use it, uh, then you also subsidize a lot of the, the rich people's consumption. And often they use much more food and energy than poor people. So uh, you have to be quite careful about these proposals. Uh, but then for Ghana, I mean, it, it would be interesting to actually go around and see what do these say? any performance certificates, what would they do in, a, in, a, in Ghana then in a big town? Uh, on the countryside, it doesn't matter so much, I think. But then again, yeah, I think that a lot of the increased energy use in Ghana come from people then who build houses and move into apartments. 
So I, I think there's uh, room for checking out how you can actually set up any performance certificates for an African town and country. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, uh, um, Amid, for those observations and uh, uh, bonjour for uh, the uh, response. Uh, Oli. Um, yeah. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have a quick question because there seems to be an assumption that the the science or the data will speak for itself when it comes to a decision whether to invest in a better a better energy use or efficiency. For my experience, having lived in Europe, that's become a very political because it's outsourced. There are management companies that basically make this decision not necessarily based on the data, but based on the commission they can cut from uh, having now re uh, replace the roof, for example. How do you basically depoliticize this process and the whole system of commission and construction that is built around it? Thank you. Thank you, Oli. Oh yeah, the building industry is special. Uh, and typically that there, there are a limited number of big players then who uh, often have very good connections with politicians. So that, that's one thing that is very difficult to approach uh, and Sweden is no exception in this area. So we have our own building companies and there is basically no competition from any EU firms coming in and trying to reduce prices. Uh, so the, the cost of building houses I, I think is uh, relatively high compared to what they would have be, been if we could increase the competition just a little bit. Uh, then uh, for good and bad, you have firms who are exploiting uh, energy transformation and energy efficiency. So uh, I, uh, I do think it's kind of good that you have a market here for consultants coming in uh, and come with suggestions for improving stuff. The thing is, of course, that you need to have those evaluated by other professionals in the same way as if you go to a doctor and they prescribe various cures for your illness. If you don't know they have a certificate and works in an honest way, let's say, you don't know the recommendations you are getting. You, you might pay for stuff that is not really paying off. So sometimes, you know, solar panels on the roof can be quite expensive. You're not really getting your money back compared to doing other investments that you can do. Uh, so uh, it is popular to put solar panels on your houses in Sweden. And, and in, in my house, you also have those suggestions, but uh, when we compare with other investments we can do, the solar panels come way down on the list, even though we can get some subsidiarities from the government. And I think that many of these suggestions come from media uh, and other sources and the people who sell this stuff are very good at selling it and they also give you uh, a perspective of how much you can save that is often a little bit flawed from a finance perspective because they, they don't really understand the difference between present and future values for instance and, and the comparisons are often you know not really a good comparison so that they even though big firms that are supposedly extremely serious are actually pushing solar panels sometimes a bit too much I would say when I look into the calculations they give me both for our say housing society and for my own private house on the countryside so it is is a market where you say are in need of say you can say uh, unbiased advice so sometimes a good government agency 
that is uncorrupt could be a good thing here, who can actually give you an unbiased second opinions about what you think you, you should do. Uh, th thanks again, uh, um, um, uh, Oli, and uh, thanks also, Bojo, for those uh, um, uh, discussion and helpful um, uh, views. Uh, Jun Hong, um, you have your hand up. Uh, please unmute and uh, yeah. Ask your question. Hi, hi, uh, hi, uh, Bajo. I think it's very interesting uh, research, and uh, it remind me when I buying my house. Also, just think <laughs> about do I price uh, for this, you know, energy saving certificate. Um, so uh, I think my questions will be related to all these one. So uh, I think it might be interesting to know uh, from to what extent and what channel of the car certificate can influence the price of the house. So if, if you can, I, I'm sure, are you able to be, you know, uh, see this impact will be depends on their, you know, uh, the price of the uh, saying this energy. So I think if there's high, you know, the cost of energy is high to this, the price higher, or it'll be other channels seeing, uh, I think you mentioned the government was implement, uh, if you can saving, you know, uh, reducing your mortgage to uh, some extent. So maybe you can also seeing is because of this policy impact on this uh, certificate on the house of pricing or because of the, 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 the owner consider of they can save more uh, energy when they're living in the apartment or because of uh, all this mentioned about political other uh, you know, issues cause the price of the house can be very uh, varies because of these uh, you know, uh, energy issues. Yeah, I think it's very interesting here that, I mean, the basic idea about the these performance certificates is that they should really matter when properties are sold and they should create a difference then. So the most interesting research here is of course to uh, look at when the same property has been sold at least twice during a sample period to see then if the effect gets stronger both over time and if then improvements during say the lifetime here of these certificates actually improves uh, the investments and affects the price more. Because we should think about this as a, I mean the time aspect is of course interesting because these things are discussed much more today than say 10 years ago and the signal is quite clear from the government and many others that you know the cost of energy is likely to go up over the years so you have to think quite carefully about those costs and don't buy a big house if you can't afford it right and one big cost for you will be the energy so if you can do more to save energy and improve the energy efficiency that is of course a very good thing and, and you should really be aware of it, which is the purpose of the certificates, of course. So besides then just increasing, you know, various uh, prices and input taxes here and there and direct price uh, subsidies here and there, uh, cheaper financing is an interesting tool then. And then one could probably do a little more research on how these green bonds could be used to stimulate further investments here. And uh, what is then the size of those investments really? How much do you really need to put down the borrowing costs before people really start to become interested in this? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And I can see uh, above that there are uh, further interesting issues from the way uh, uh, you are helpful response. Uh, not only in terms of um, the extent to which the energy um, um, uh, um, uh, 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 pricing will affect the um, 
uh, cost of the house. Um, you are using both the hedonic pricing model and uh, quantile regulation, so you can capture both the linear and nonlinear and uh, easily interpret this. Uh, but you also introduced something now in your answer about um, uh, the taxes. Uh, you know, tax uh, um, uh, could be a, um, the opposite, of course, is a, a subsidy, a negative tax would be a subsidy. But both the positive tax and the negative one, the subsidy, uh, create incentives and maybe um, they create a kind of um, way if the market is up, you have to you tax that. If, if, if then uh, there is a, um, a, um, a mushrooming of our private investments, then uh, yeah, you introduce, you raise the, uh, uh, the tax. So there could be a public policy uh, implications through taxation and subsidy elements. I'm not sure whether this applies to uh, to to the case study you are looking at in Sweden, uh, but I guess in many countries it would. Yeah, in terms of if you look at the property taxes, if you yeah. can get an idea about, say, improvements that you could do on your house that might affect the property value, that reduce energy then you, you could think about different property taxes then for different energy efficient houses and then if you then implement in such a way that you as uh, you could reduce your property tax from doing these investments then you would have a good effect of course if you just uh, raise taxes on the less energy efficient houses yeah you collect more taxes but if you really can't do any improvements of energy efficiency, then there is no effect, of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, any other comments in the chat? I can't see any further comments in the chat. And uh, I cannot see uh, any hands um, up. Uh, if you want to say something, please uh, raise uh, your hand uh, in the chat or just unmute and uh, intervene. Um, uh, uh, if not, I really want to thank you uh, so much, uh, Bo, uh, for this um, uh, interesting uh, 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 piece of work that uh, you've uh, shared with us. And um, I also I, uh, want to think that uh, a couple of people uh, might be, you know, conducting a new course in view of introducing this uh, uh, a new research uh, on uh, energy prices, perhaps. Uh, uh, in terms of the previous seminars we have had, uh, uh, this is a, you know very refreshing. Uh, maybe uh, you could share the uh, paper if you have a version of the paper that could be shared, and then uh, we can have a uh, uh, main could upload that on the um, Center for Flow Finance Working Paper Series, and then that means that um, um, uh, in, uh, people here, colleagues who may be able to access it, and uh, as a part of your dissemination yeah. uh, uh, for uh, the project, uh, if you so wish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the the paper is just being rewritten then, and we intend to send it to a, a journal in a few weeks' time. So we are mainly waiting for yeah, our guy to do his new regressions ah, to okay. test some other hypotheses, and then it will be finalized quite Excellent. soon. Excellent. And uh, I, I do hope that uh, you find uh, all these uh, comments and the discussion, uh, the cut and thrust to this um, uh, seminar, uh, absolutely helpful in terms of providing input for uh, uh, for this work and uh, for the future research projects that you may uh, be wanting to embark on. So uh, thank you very much, Bojo. Uh, let me thank all the participants for making the time uh, at join this, uh, 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 this uh, meeting. Uh, next week, uh, we have uh, an interesting uh, um, uh, seminar uh, uh, by uh, Isof Somare from Laval University in Canada, uh, which will be uh, looking into bank regulation issues. So uh, please join us uh, next week about today. Thank you so much and uh, um, have a nice day.